Um, today, I, I'm not, this is not going to be um, a conventional lecture that you hear in this lecture hall. And um, so that, that, and that's kind of thematic for what I'm going to be talking about. Um, the book that I um, will, my new book, which I'll be reading to you from, is not um, something categorizable by genre. Um, and we'll be talking about the implications of that sort of thing. Um, so I think that um, genre is something that every writer who doesn't, or every person who works in a non-categorizable categorizable, um, world <coughs> has to contend with. And this will be a talk and a reading to you from the book about one kind of contention with that. Um, and I, I really, do, oh, were you able to hear me when I wasn't at the mic? Yeah. Okay, good, that's good to know. Um, so I'm going to be reading to you, kind of bed, bedtime story style. So you should feel free to just relax and close your eyes and listen. Um, and I'm also going to be reading to you thinking out loud style. So, um, oh, and you'll have to bear with me as I navigate the tech in a very slow manner. Um, let's see. This is the cover of the book that just came out, Coming Events. Um, so, it, it is 22 years of work. It's all of the writing that I've done that, that I think should be published or should even maybe be published that isn't um, categorizable as poetry. Um, When you publish a book, you have to say what the genre is that it fits in. And when you read a book, as you know, if you're told that it's poetry, you approach it in an entirely different way than if you're told that it's a selection of essays. Why do you have to say the genre? Well, it, it makes it marketable. And also, the Library of Congress requires that for an ISBN number. There are all kinds of reasons that you have to say the genre. So um, I'm going to be telling you a lot of stories. And the first story I'm going to tell you is about um, when I graduated from Evergreen. And I realized I wanted to go to graduate school in folklore. And I went to UC Berkeley and spoke with Alan Dundies, the guy who um, was the chair of the folklore department at the time, and I was interested in his work. And um, I had a conversation with him. And somewhere in the conversation, I don't remember where, I must have said that I was a poet. And he said to me, poets do not belong in academia. So, um, that is the first experience of being a genre of person that didn't fit the genre of academia. Um, I guess I should, because it's rel, I never would say this otherwise, but I just realized I should probably say that since then I have a PhD, but not in folklore. Okay, <laughs> um, so let's see, let's move on to the next image here. This is the table of contents to the book. And we can think of it as an aerial view of the book. And um, I'm going to say, just explain to you a little bit about the structure of the book. So the book is called Coming Events. It has three sections, obviously. The first section, three desks. The, section, the second section, address, and the third, third apprehension. So these three sections 
um, among many other things, I hope do suggest a kind of dialectic motion in which something else can occur um, between them. Um, three Desks has a lot to do with um, the work of modernist writer Dorothy Richardson, who wrote a 13-volume epic novel called Pilgrimage. I wrote my dissertation about her work, and while I was writing it, I had to have two other desks next to me. <laughs> one with writing that was clearly not the dissertation writing, one that was writing that seemed to me to be poetry. Um, and I had to go back and forth between the different writings. So this is about the three desks scene of writing. Um, and, and it's also excerpts from that scene of writing. A dress is, um, as you can see, mostly writing that is occasional. Somebody asked me to do it, it's written to someone in a more specific way than <coughs> most writing, or I would say even all writing is written to someone, whether consciously or not. Third apprehension, this is where a kind of practice that um, has pulled from all of these kinds of writing and is trying to propose another kind of writing um, which is in the last piece, Outer Event, proposed as um, a writing that is um, hypocritical, the writing of the hypocrite. Um, this writing is, is a, as I say, it's where the, um, where the writing has started to work on each other, infiltrate one another. Um, it's maybe, un, it may be the, well, not the most un unidentifiable, but a continuation of the kind of, let's say, resistance to identify a kind of writing more than elsewhere in the book. Um, so that's the aerial view of what's happening and I want to read, you, read to you from the book. Um, and I'm, gonna be, I'm going to begin in the end of the book, which was once the beginning, as so often happens in writing and its endless revisions. And I'm going to begin with the postgraphs and what I like to call the invocation, even though it's the end. So I'm hoping that. Um, these will make a kind of encircling, a kind of place from which we can continue to talk about the book and the issues that it raises and many other things. Um, because my biggest hope is to hear what you have to say about these sorts of things in your own lives when I stop talking. So, the postgraphs. For my pathetic wish to be loved, I will substitute a power to love, not an absurd will to love anyone or anything, not identifying myself with the universe, but extracting the pure event which unites me with those whom I love, who await me no more than I await them, since the event also awaits us. Eventum tantum, making an event, however small, is the most delicate thing in the world, the opposite of making a drama or making a story. Loving those who are like this, when they enter a room, they are not persons, characters, or subjects, but an atmospheric variation, a change of hue, an imperceptible molecule, a discrete population, a fog or a cloud of droplets. Everything has really changed. Great events, too, are made in this way. Battle, revolution, life and death. True entities are events, not concepts. It is not easy to think in terms of the event, all the harder since thought itself then becomes an event. Entity equals event. It is terror, but also great joy. That's from um, Deleuze and Parnay dialogues. And the other postgraph. Coming events cast light. It is like dropping everything and walking backwards 
to something you know is there. That's Dorothy Richardson um, from her novel, The Tunnel. Um, and now for the last page. When the angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites, marking doors, dispensing the Pharaoh's rule as discursives of moral good and evil, just, unjust to some, and sent and <coughs> saved others under the sign of the bloody X that became wandering in the desert, running hither and thither, passing irregularly from one locality to another, exile on others, my forehead, the forehead of my house, received an X. Sent to the lions, the snakes by the river, who secretly romp together, disrupting, passing from premises to conclusions by discourse of reason, ratiocinative, the believed order of the nature of animal behavior, I departed, running about to the right and the left, laying the separate notices together. Here I dwell and wander. Gather round, children of circumstance, while I pass the plate. Let chance, occasion, contingency, condition, happenstance, the circling stars, the odds, hazard, mistake, incident, be our debtors. Take us hostage. So we have no choice but to pack up and climb out the window. That is, to run away, to write, to run back into the burning house. Glory to the combination lock with its lost numbers and the way we look up at story time, thinking the face of the teacher is the book and our circle the story clock. Come, diverge, perplex, tell, ask, spoken for, speak with, quotation, juxtaposition, diagnosis as proposition, braid doom dwellers, <laughs> wanderers, and the able, unable. Which dis is it keeping us doubters, dancers, the aimfully inarticulate, aphasic, estranged, chronically embarrassed, those who cannot leave the all-you-can-eat smorgasbord, weepers, the exhilarated, army of archers, turn, bend, twist, spin, brush the knee, and strike. This invocation opens up and calls our attention to the question of what counts as an event, especially a discursive event. Um, you may have heard me bracket with my voice uh, certain definitions of discursive, which were included in that invocation. And it focuses us on a troubled, even pathological relation to the discursive, to writing and story. It is a gathering whose purpose is to address this trouble as one might address trouble in a martial art. The last words are the names for postures in a Tai Chi form that I practice. But this is certainly not only my trouble. At most, uh, rather as most everyone in this room knows, especially the students doing a lot of writing, writing is hard and its difficulties can exacerbate and bring to the surface all kinds of latent emotional and other difficulties. But what is hard about writing is often not actually only personal, but an index of ways in which writing is part of a larger knowledge making and having system. If I could, right now I would pass around some artifacts from the difficult scene of writing. On this side, I would pass around boxes of drafts of the many rounds of proofs for this new book, um, coming events. And the boxes would be heavy. You'd have to get up to move them from one person to another. And they would be full of typed pages, handwriting, and combinations, and folds, and tears and it would be disruptive because it's really disruptive to um, pile up a lot of writing. And on the other side, I would pass around some finished books and um, it would be easy to pass them around. They're, they're contained objects. 
So um, since I teach and we are at a school, I want to talk a little bit about my relation to writing and teaching, regardless of subject that I'm teaching, as the two have always overlapped and informed one another. I address this in the first piece of Coming Events, titled My Little Read Backwards Book. I'm going to read that to you now, because this piece also addresses um, the problems that um, one encounters when being taught to read and to write and to understand what um, legit discursive thought looks like or feels like when it's passed around in a box. So, my little read backwards book. When the mother interrupts the small child while she is deep, deeply engrossed in play, the child learns to interrupt herself. Speak between lines a talk that may not, not escape its breasted body either, nor its lambasted psyche sinking to the floor. No. Offspring, what we ask of you is reverse comfort tactics. In gastriloquy, once I spoke with the birds. After the trees shut up, no grammars have caught me. Speech rising, cunt, stomach, throat, up through the trunk, but canceled early. First grade was the first fire retardant. They snuffed them out all at once, a whole room of us bound tidily at our desks. I saw us attempt to comply, most too young to sit still for long. I saw that there were codes escaping me again. They were in numbers and manners. The tone of instruction telegraphed punishment first, then maybe reward, never understanding. I could see that there would be consequences, but wasn't clear on their nature. Something to do with leave the room and stay in it at the same time. Institution starts early and stays in some like a badge of honor, stays on others like an encounter with a skunk, but stays. A small breakdown, undetectable to others maybe, a processing glitch in the brain, a perception error of the emotional landscape. A deprivation chamber can only seem to be one if there is something else to compare it to. There was a school where dinosaur bones could be found in a sandbox. In exile or just an idiot, flummoxed, distressed, regressed, and so reversion to language before and during trauma, before and after drama of this public. Tossed and turned all night. Which dis is it keeping me awake? Phoria, Lexia, Topia? Gather around, daughters, and I will tell you a story. Debasement, my familiar. Come sit on my right. Come to me again. Let me feel the usual. Done what I can with what was given, was inborn. What more? So it goes after another exposure to the academic, to which I am allergic. Even the buildings as I enter a campus, like the driveway where I approach that I may say something wrong, or the dinner table where no voice but one can be heard. There was suddenly a hard rain in the night, and I was up for the duration. It is not only my driveway or dinner table, not only my night, my rain, my sense that there's something awry in the belfry that tolls hourly. Quote, what distinguishes philosophy from mythology is generally thought to be the presence of arguments supporting its assertions. There is nothing to argue or assert. Mythology and philosophy have not yet banished the propositions of poetry. Imagining or remembering a time, but not exactly in nostalgia, more a time parallel to the time of trauma, a time sustained against the broken time of interruption. The conditions funnel certain necessary kinds and orders of speech. Is that what gets separated at birth and then fashioned into myth or argument? 
The situation of disturbance or idiocy I am describing that occurs after the separation, the interruption, is a martial situation which requires a response. Gather round and I will tell you a story of distrust of story, but reliance on story, as it was all that was available and sometimes is all that is available. Distrust of story because it makes a case for itself, not because of its linear progression. Things are not where I left them, the crooked way. So this becomes more a following of crumbs left by little Jewish girl of the 50s drinking from the well of my little red, green, and blue storybooks from one. Susan said, Father, Betty, see the funny airplane? See the funny, funny airplane? Tom said, see Susan go. See Susan and father. See the airplane go up and down. Then at about 12 years old, inventing a way to teach those younger than me, having difficulties reading, how to read backwards. First, I'd record them telling a story. Then they wrote down their story while listening to the transcript of their own voice then adjusted the order of the telling if it needed adjusting, and made pictures to go with it. Then they read this book back to me aloud as I recorded them. Then I played the recording of them reading their story back to them. Oddly, this worked pretty well. Maybe I then continued to teach as a kind of reparation for having been distaught, and maybe as a stopgap for future not yet happened disaster traumas like mine that could visit, or may have already visited, others. So again, while I use the first person here, I hope it's clear that this is not just about me. It is about a social condition in which we all write and live. Obviously, not everyone in academia participates in this regime of class diagnosis, and editing. In terms of the overlap between teaching and writing practices, this piece introduces many of the most urgent issues that have fueled the writing in this book. Gender and genre, and their relation to public speech of students and professors. The hierarchic nature of academic and other institutions as privilege and class-making machines. Teaching as a potential site for intervention into the reign of one right way of reading or writing and more. I want to tell a few stories now about genre circulating in and around the vicinity of coming events. That makes sense, okay. Um, under the figure of Proteus, wait, let me just see something for a second. Yeah. Hmm. Um, So, actually, I'm going to backtrack a little bit for a minute. Um, so, back to this table of contents for a minute. The dialectic that this triadic division of the table of contents suggests is, as I was saying, a hope of compost, regeneration, motion. It's not like the quote-unquote cross-genre writing, which is what this book ended up being um, categorized as. Um, just became an interesting idea. Things were and are at stake. For example, um, some of the things the doctor editor piece in coming events focuses on, the way editing highlights the fact that all reading is diagnostic, um, never neutral, thus requires examination of the positions of editor, reader, doctor, patient, etc., all the time. In the doctor editor piece, I use medical textbooks that teach doctors how to successfully diagnose patients as a way to think about what might count as a healthy normal body and behavior of a poem or poet 
or any reader or writer. Um, I'm not going, I'm, I was going to read a small excerpt from this piece, um, the first section called Shaking Hands, but I think that I will save that for later. Um, so, needless to say, the same things that are at stake in um, medical diagnosis are at stake on the page. Um, diagnoses of mental and formal illness, health, etc. These also apply to the diagnosis of the poet. Genre, close linguistic cousin to gender and class, race, et cetera, and the resultant in and exclusion on and off page, screen, and elsewhere. And needless to say, the definitions or regimes of health and illness are also regimes of genre. At the same time, there are dangers in conflating the body of the writing and the body under the doctor's gaze. More about that later if we have time. But we do write with discrete generic models in mind, or at least most of us have been taught to write that way. So different models shape different kinds of writing behavior. Here, I think we need the help of Proteus. Um, let's look at a few images of Proteus. Enter Proteus. Under the figure of Proteus, the transitive, formative, against the overlocated, the fixed, known. Proteus enters from the Odyssey, and, and here I quote the Odyssey. The prophetic old man of the sea, Alios Geron, herdsman of seals, who can see through the whole depth of the sea and tends the seal flocks of Poseidon. At midday, he rises from the flood and sleeps in the shadow of the rocks of the coast, and around him lie monsters of the deep. Anyone wishing to compel him to foretell the future was obliged to catch hold of him at that time. He indeed had the power of assuming every possible shape in order to escape the necessity of prophesying. But whenever he saw that his endeavors were of no avail, he resumed his usual appearance and told the truth. When he had finished his prophecy, he returned into the sea. That's the end of the quote from the Odyssey. But the quote unquote truth could also be seen as just another of Proteus's forms. Moved by fear or the force of restraint, to don the shape of recognizable, read, truthful, legible discourse. Again, about Proteus from the Odyssey. He became in turn a bearded lion, a snake, a panther, a monstrous boar, then running water, then a towering and leafy tree. But we kept our hold, unflinching and undismayed. And in the end, this master of dreaded secrets began to tire. So he broke into speech and asked outright, Son of Atreus, which of the gods taught you this strategy to entrap and overpower me? Thus, what do you want from me? Speech is a breakdown, broken, overpowered, Proteus speaks. Telling is a response to entreaty as threat. What do you want from me? The requirement to speak in the register of quote unquote truthful discourse to prophesize is not an invitation, it's a demand from those who can't or from those who decide what counts as truth. So we're gonna keep Proteus hovering in our um, uh, peripheral vision while I tell you another story. This story is about the order of one of the pieces in the book. Um, the piece is called about about. And um, 
I was asked to um, have it included in an anthology on motherhood because um, poets and motherhood, poets writing um, at any stage of motherhood. Um, so I gave the piece to the editors and the, the piece has what is recognizable as poetry first and then it has more discursive writing next. Um, and the editors told me that they wanted to reverse it because they were afraid that the order from poetry to discursive writing would thwart publication, or rather not publication, would thwart the um, selling of the book because people wouldn't um, be able to read the explanation for the poetry before reading the poetry. So I said, well, then I don't want to thwart the sales of your book. Let's just not put it in. And um, they said, no, 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 it's, it's OK. Um, I, I guess you can put it in the way that you want. But why did I do it? Why was I so emphatic and insistent? It's because my belief is that the prose does not explain the poetry any more than the poetry explains the prose. And um, I wanted to, I, I've, in, in this current book and in any kind of project I've worked on, I haven't wanted to um, assume that one illuminates the other, but that they might be illuminating each other in all kinds of ways, but not in an explanatory fashion that requires a certain sequence to read. So, um, oh, that's a cell phone. Good, I'm glad it's not coming from here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna read to you um, that, that uh, piece about, about. It begins with resuscitations. Arm leg kindling gather where water blankets sound. Take her down again, again, quiet crown. Was strong, singing heart, you swimming, practicing breathing, strip mining the superfluous. To anything recalled ever, to everything ever summoned, the former a project of the former. Sea fence, sea gate, said promise of plenty, said gather greens of tomorrow, mainland winds mountain up once every 4,200 seconds. From lucid sea, like none ever witnessed, abbreviation, the situation engineered a couldn't say, or far worse. And so tending to every and none, seeing, not saying, bluntly, a management preoccupation in familiar waters. Carefully considered beginning rests with the rest, turning away turns the turned. What is the meaning of the word lagoon? What a tribute that you're all still here, sweet nothings. Warm in flannel under the ground, here's what we'll do. When you sleep, I'll sleep. When you wake up, I'll wake up. A long way to Tipperary, to the place by the ocean, it's fishermen and, and fine sand see the crypt correcting herself. Land owners want land. Boat owners want bones, boats want short wave, sound wants bait, land lies in wait. Someone was behind her, also a man was near, pointing, you're still there, unable to name or swim, panting. Between finger and singer, machines refrain, between teeth, the difference. Crosshairs correcting the spiral of wandering attention's gun scope, once I arrived, landscapes low status, slow statues. Of noise, no promise longer than sees sleep that never rests, short of words, over over scent. Stick figure swaddled in chain mail, escape hatch unlocks picture postcards, fingers touch. By sees preface before the world was faceless, now her face take swallows silence soon down. The word regret, the word repent, whiplash on halved horizon beheaded by halves, the almost left holds hope behind right's back. 
belies the way face belies fact, an act to cover the desire for never achieved or relation to idea as act. Wound or sunken, awoken, profile, proximities, imposition, face on, face of. And at our last parting, last words, I promised in folded routing in the gulf offing. Written in caterpillar scar, constellation written in rain star, launch reserves, literally last week's facsimile face used up. Planaria aria, axis belief, voids all attempts sent to preliminary galaxy beyond belief's chair. When the phone rings and no one is there, I say to my grandmother, next time, wait a little longer and we can speak. Absence of breath at the receiver. Because it conveys voice, the phone is an instrument of breath. But the poem is not an instrument. It's an incident. It occurs at the moment of picking up the silent phone. The moment when the dead have just ceased to speak and just begun to speak, and the newly born have not yet resorted to the inadequacy of words, having just come from worlds of far more subtle articulation. For this moment, this death in life, when our breath is taken away, yet turns and returns, Ceylon co coins the word atomvend. The breath is clock. The breath makes re reading hearing. What time is it? Time to listen for your life. That is, to write. Sometimes we write so as to name an age, the one that comes to us from our mother. Sometimes to celebrate the natal event, and the author of the event, the mother. That's Siksu. Sometimes all authors fall away, and writing writes the collision of events. Our breath is taken away. It is true that Cleo was born on April 6, 1997, and also true that my 91-year-old grandmother died three weeks later. This three weeks was a turning of breath, a lathe, in which an encounter occurred, a shape was presented. My grandmother never met Cleo, but she saw pictures. I spoke to her on the phone a few hours after Cleo was born. I called her often in the first weeks of Cleo's life. In those weeks, she was shuttling between many worlds, but whenever I called, she immediately and clearly said, how is she? The poem, as always, is about about which means that events were an environment of conversation, but the poem is not about events. The poem is about the impossibility of writing about events in disguise as convoys for about, but actually serving only as decoys, since about is never actually possible, are the conventions of telling, of grammar, of reading from left to right, of story, etc. After the necessary abolishment of these decoys from the land of the poem, after about falls away, only about about is left. Only the decoys of the decoys are left. At the same time that my grandmother was going and coming, Cleo was trying to stay. She was kept an extra day in the hospital for observation as she had Apnea, uneven breathing with alarmingly long pauses between breaths. I had sat at my grandmother's bedside for 10 days in January when she seemed to be dying. Her breath was also ragged. Sometimes she sounded like someone running, then the parched lips and rasp of great thirst, then nothing, next a half-smothered inhale, a sudden deep breath, and back again to an uneven rhythm. The sound of the story, the shadow of the story on the ground, displaces its small body high up in a sky, getting smaller and farther away each time the phone rings. One evening during that January bedside vigil when I was seven months pregnant, my grandmother said she heard a baby crying. I was not in the room. My sister told me to come in. 
I had recently read that at this stage of fetal development, babies can cry in utero. I found this disturbing. How can you hear the crying? How can you comfort a baby who is crying inside? When I arrived in my grandmother's room, my grandmother said, come here. She put one hand on my stomach and closed her eyes. Then she added the other hand. Oh, she's crying, but she will be OK, she said, her eyes still closed. Then she said, sweet baby, and began to hum. Then, you will be lucky. You will have a wonderful life. You will be healthy. All will be well, humming to the baby, patting my stomach. Are you there, either of you? I see my invisible, the thing that will come from us to us so as not to escape us. After she died, I dreamed of my grandmother wrapped in a black shroud laid out on a low table on a stage. I walked through the rooms of a house and found her there, though I was looking for Cleo. When I saw my grandmother instead, I said, swaddle shroud. Each couplet in the poem requires a full breath and ends when the breath would run out. For Cleo, for Helen. So let's stir this story into a soup with the ion, the Socratic dialogue. Because in this dialogue, as you probably recall, we learn that Ion, the rhapsode, prize-winning renderer of Homer, cannot interpret the poetry he sings. Socrates says to Ion, for not by art does the poet sing, but by power divine. Had he learned by rules of art, he would have known how to speak, not of one theme only, but of all. And therefore, God takes away the minds of poets. If we write in the West, we write under this inherited assumption that poets work by inspiration and cannot think about that which they sing. By extension and often assumption that poetry is not a thinking. In the end of the Ion, Socrates says to Ion, but if as I believe you have no art but speak all these beautiful words about Homer unconsciously under his inspiring influence, then I acquit you of dishonesty and shall only say that you are inspired. Which do you prefer to be thought, dishonest or inspired? The next question in this line of questioning is, how do we recognize thinking? And how do we regulate membership in the thinking class? This is not a question for only poets. And I'm really ambivalent about this one, as I believe a lot can be learned and thought in the dialect of rigorous academic critical thinking and writing. Inspiration and invention do and can occur in that um, dialect. In my ideal school, students would be taught how to write in many different genres. But back to the Western tradition. With poets now banished from analysis of poetry and from the republic or the realm of the thinking rational state, how do we recognize rigor thinking and argument in writing that is not academic? Can it only exist outside of the academy or city? What does critical writing look like offer on the page, the screen, etc., or in the commons, a public square, as shown on the cover of the coming events book? Um, I'm going to show some images, and I ask you to consider whether rigorous analysis or thinking can look like any of these images. I so hope I'm going to show you images. OK, so I'm switching to this thing. How about that? That. In what is called thinking, Heidegger says, memory is the gathering of thought. Thought of what? Thought of what holds us, in that we give it thought precisely because it remains what must be thought about. 
Thought has the gift of thinking back, a gift given because we incline toward it. That's my hope, what I call a third apprehension, which is also the title of the third section of coming events. To keep alive this question, what does thinking look like? And to hold open a place, neither bearded lion, snake, running water, towering and leafy tree, but something more like a reciprocity between all these monstrous creatures. Something that could be shapes of thinking. A model for this is offered by the artist whose name I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce, and if anyone knows the correct pronunciation, please tell me. Um, Shi Shui Wang, who has helped to envision what Proteus may have been before being figured as male. The program notes for his talk, titled Fish That Change Sex, delivered at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco in March, tells us this. But first, I want to show you some images of his work, which requires a little fancy footwork here. OK, so we're going back to that. Going to this. Come on. Ah, excellent. That's his work. That's his work. I'll leave you looking at that while I read to you a little bit more. So the program notes for his talk, Fish That Change Sex. When it comes to sexuality, no human can compare to the variety of sexes and sexual behaviors of lower vertebrates. Evolution has rewarded fishes that change sex in either direction, that have harems, female and male, that in a pinch can mate with themselves and perform a variety of other sexual strategies. Dr. John McCosker of the California Academy of Sciences explains why and what to look for when next visiting an aquarium, a kelp bed, or a coral reef. When next visiting the scene of writing or reading, what would it be like for us to behave, that is to write, in a relation to genre modeled on that of the so-called lower vertebrates. And here are some. This model might involve reciprocity and genre fluidity a visit to the shadows of the rocks of the coast, surrounded by monsters of the deep, without an attempt to banish or harness them, what would that look like? In her book, Stigmata, Helene Sixou tells us what is in those shadow seas. She says, when I close my eyes, the passage opens, the dark gorge, I descend, there is no more genre. There are, I think, some examples of no more genre or genre hybridity, fluidity, that involve what poet critic Benjamin Hollander calls analytic lyric. Hollander says, quote, a critical interpretation of a text can itself constitute an analytic lyric rather than simply a normative or explicative approach to a work. An analytic lyric, by which I mean a writing, that can inhabit a site where poetry and the methods of examining it converge in a critically informed music. A writing moved to a dramatic and participatory lyric gesture by the occasions and or poetic texts which provoked it. These kinds of writing remain outside the critical canon 
of the critical adept critical method. And they represent the work of such seminal figures as Robert Duncan, the HD book, Paul Ceylon, collected prose, and more recently, Susan Howe's My Emily Dickinson. Is analytic lyric an approach that can be useful only to poets, or is it relevant for other kinds of writers? In his notebooks, poet Clark Coolidge says, at the same time, there is the plethora, proliferation of all forms, making a muck, unforeseen previously. Beckett's statement, 1961, quote, to find a form that accommodates the mess, that is the task of the artist now, seems pointed exactly at our condition. End quote. I'd like to end by reading a few pages from my most recent book of poetry, Aerodrome, Orion, and Starry Messenger. Um, I say poetry in quotation marks because this book is the result of lots of research of many different kinds, and among the many different possible readings of it, I would hope that it might be evident that analysis and argument are present. Some of the research has involved uh, research into air traffic control, languages, the constraints and politics of airspace, fantasies of the sky, legend, um, in, in legend and fairy tale and elsewhere, and a reading and investigation of Galileo's 1610 piece called Starry Messenger. So that's the cover of the book. That's a pa some pages from the book, that as well. And, ah, no, no, no. Um, so let me see, where is that? Oh, I think I can close this. Go to this. So I want to um, play a video from the, the from the web for you. Uh, um, so I'm just gonna play this while I read um, to you the first few pages of this book, Aerodrome, Orion, and Starry Messenger, since it had a lot of um, impact on my thinking in the book. Trade here for here, kinetic emporium. Cell wind direction, cumulonimbus by eye. Lie back to become patient, a history of information, a portrait. Spin in the flying city, firefly carrier of pandemic, skirting the world as the business of the day below the night withers the day. As the year continues, the daily life of incompletion, the dangerous life of true north, and the eight directions of the compass, sighting surface wind without sensor. One more time. Squall, funnel cloud, drifting, blowing, snow, sand, or dust, heroic, fog to the west, severe turbulence and icing, thickening, beyond plot, way beyond binoculars of plot. And I'm going to stop there and happy to talk with you about any of this you want to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments, anything like that? Whoa. Have you ever seen this before? Um, yeah, it's pretty interesting to think of what's going on above us. That was from, um, I think, 2006. We can only assume that it's become um, more congested since then. Yes? In, uh, some of your writings, you mentioned that you had uh, maybe something that's more creative or classified as poetry or something, and then, and then part of it being discursive writing, commentary or, or a 
analysis of what you're writing. Do you differentiate um, in formatting, like as, as far as the text in the book? Well, that's a good question. Um, did everybody hear that question? He's asking whether I differentiate in formatting between just what I'm calling discursive writing and what I'm calling poetry. Um, <laughs> yes, but um, it, yes in some cases, because it depends on what the occasion has been for. Um, in most cases in this book, the, the discursive writing and the poetry um, blend into one another or come out of one another. And so you won't find a piece which is only in one kind of writing. Um, in fact, well, um, yeah, my Little Read Backwards book is in paragraphs, um, except when it breaks into the quote from my Little Green storybook about Susan, go get the airplane or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions or comments? Oh, or assaults? <laughs> yeah. This is kind of vague, but what is, what is form to you? What is genre? Oh my goodness. That's a very big question. Um, and a great question. Um, I think that, first of all, I, form is a distinct thing from genre in my mind. Um, genre, I think of as a, um, a classification system that um, tells us how, I'm going to talk, I'll speak in terms of reading and writing, although as I've implied, I hope, I, can, I think that kind of system expands way beyond just reading and writing. Um, so it, it, it's a system of um, how to read what expectations to have of what a writing will accomplish for you. And um, if you're, for example, being trained in doing a quote unquote academic critical writing, then there are absolute rules about what can and cannot um, be done, what footnotes need to look like or endnotes. Um, there are stylistic, tonal expectations, content inclusion and exclusion expectations. Not to say that people don't violate these. And so, so any way I speak is, is um, too absolute. But I think that as a person who's learning how to write in a particular kind of genre, um, especially the absolute end comes to bear. Um, so d does that yeah. help? Yeah. And of course, one comes to poetry, um, what's called poetry, usually expecting to be able to relax and not think about things, and it's just going to be pretty. And, and, and again, an absurd generalization, but, but generally probably true until one stops to think about it. Any other questions, comments? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you were confronted early on about poetry and academia, and then you went ahead and got a doctorate, and you wrote a dissertation, and you're now <coughs> asking questions about different styles or different approaches to writing. In your dissertation, did you play with it? <laughs> That's or did a great you? question, too. Um, I very much wanted to. And I went into the PhD program that I was in, expecting that I would be able to, not based on anything that had been said or declared, but because of what I thought was the nature of the program. But I was very wrong. And um, in a sense, it's because of that wrongness that I had to develop that three-desk um, system. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's okay. I think that they, they were a machine for that kind of writing. And um, I, it, was very, it was very hard, though. And when I took the, the dissertation and rewrote it for publication, um, I, I didn't really take it out of that form, but I was able 
to um, pay attention more to things like sentence structure that might have some amb ambiguity in them that I wouldn't have been able to mm -hmm. keep in in the dissertation. But it's funny because uh, the, I, I did a lot of writing that was based on the research and writing from the dissertation, and it's in um, the, the three books section mostly. I did a lot of writing that wasn't straight up academic writing. I had to, it was like some sort of tourniquet that had to spill over somewhere else. But um, uh, where was I going with that? So, um, uh, but what, what's funny is that the, the poets who read, have read my critical book, which is um, before this one, it's called Narrative's Journey, the Fiction and Film Writing of Dorothy Richardson, and it was once my dissertation, um, say, wow, every sentence seems like it's been given attention. Like, yes, that's why it was such hell to write. <laughs> I, can't, I can't help it. I couldn't, have, I couldn't do it any other way because that's, that's a poet writing, mm -hmm. some poets, I suppose, writing something that is that kind of constrained writing. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah. I wonder how, um, as a student coming out of Evergreen in the 70s, and going to UC Berkeley and being told that poets don't get PhDs, and I, I imagine you've had other discouraging conversations along the way. How <laughs> did you uh, get into your NS program and your PhD program? How did you fit yourself into a program when it seems that your mind is one that wrestles with, okay, the container and the uncontained? Mm -hmm. I don't know how you did it. Yeah, I'm not sure either, but the thing is that it's not like I don't value the contained. And I knew that there would be an enormous amount to learn from um, the contained. And I also felt like, well, here are my choices. I can be a waitress <laughs> for 10 years, or you know, more, 50 years, or I can go into debt and I can take out a loan to, to spend my time reading and writing. And I'm positive that the time spent reading and writing will impact the poetry in some kind of way. So in a, in a certain way, I saw myself as choosing poetry by choosing a kind of strict regime of reading and writing, even though I knew I would subvert it. <laughs> so, you know, again, neither one nor the other. Sure. Anything else? Oh, yes. Um, so I'm interested in, I mean, this was really beautiful, the way you read this kind of performative moment where you read for us and, and then played this, um, this animation. And um, I was really taken by those, the question you asked, you know, can this be critical thought? And, and you showed us these um, um, Various kinds of things. I think one was a score for a Shaker hymn, mm -hmm. right? And these kind of, um, the kind of pictographs or kind of um, uh, diagrams. Yeah. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more just about. Um, it seems like there you're you're interested in, in kind of um, eroding the boundary between the graphic, the graphical, and the textual. Um, and how those things make meaning as a way to get at this larger question. I just wonder if you could talk more about that. Okay, let me get some water first. <laughs> um, yeah. Hmm. I mean, what can I say that hasn't already been said by many? Um, I guess that it's not only the graphical and the textual that, I, that interests me in this way, it's also the auditory. First of all, I'd like to complicate that a bit more. Um, and um, so if we think of ourselves as always readers and writers in everything that we do, then um, we're always in a, a state of what I call in one book of poetry, decipheritude. This is a riff on um, Brathwaite's negritude, uh, rather Césaire's uh, negritude. Um, de decipheritude means that one is always in a state of deciphering the world, and one is never done. 
and it drives you crazy and you want more once you're in that state. Um, so um, there's, there's the need to think very carefully about the means of production of whatever kind of artifact one is reading or writing. Let's say maybe even reading and writing at the same time sometimes. And since we live, we inherit um, a, a kind of idea that we can only, that we're taught how to read um, in a, a linear fashion and for content. In public schools anyway in the US, that's how we're taught how to read, to oversimplify. Um, so um, my, in showing these different kinds of things, which all may be writing, mm -hmm. or even in the quote unquote textual, all may be image, all may have um, directions and kinds of thinking embedded in them. Um, my suggestion or hope is that in the state of decipheritude, we're deciphering them all in all kinds of different ways, not just um, thinking, hmm, uh, this is a map of migration, this is a migration map. So first of all, I better Google it and find out that it's a migration map. And not to say that's unimportant to know, it's important to know that. But, um, but to, to think that it, it might be legible yeah. in some yeah. kind of way. And, it's, and all of these things are also illegible in all kinds of ways, yeah. even if it looks like straight up quote unquote English that we allegedly know. Yeah. So um, I hope that yeah. helps address what Right before you about. said legible, I was writing down, yes, the problem of legibility. Oh, yeah. It seems like that, right, yeah. so that, that beautiful page from your book where you had the, the kind of text, linear text on one side, and then the looping diagram on the other so just kind of brings forward that both present the problem of legibility. We should be thinking about the problem of legibility. Yes, and yeah. actually, um, it's, I'm glad you brought up that diagram. That is a diagram called a, oh god, I'm forgetting the name of the language, but it's a language that um, people who do um, airplane rodeos use. Oh, and um, <laughs> That's all you. Can you imagine? Right. Well, of course, they yeah. don't saddle the airplane, right. but they kind of do. They learn um, a a diagram to fly the plane in, mm -hmm. and then they have a show where different pilots fly that same route. Mm -hmm. Like in a horse show, or a dog mm -hmm. show, or anything else, but it's planes. Mm -hmm. And so that that is a um, also a kind of migration route, or a, a map anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, and and I, I want to say one other thing about that, um, which is that in terms of the auditory, I. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the sound artist um, Scanner or Robert uh, Robin Rimbaud. So um, I was I really very much wanted to work with um, the sounds of air traffic control and the text of this poem. And I I saw uh, Robin Rimbaud, which if you don't know his work, it's really interesting, and I suggest that you look it up. Uh, and I I I heard him talk, and after this. When this book was in process, I thought oh, it would be so fantastic to do a sound piece with him. And I got in touch with him, and um, he lives in London. And long story short, I actually went to London, and we made a sound piece, which I've performed with, um, with that video and, and with some other images. And um, the piece is the sound of air traffic controllers talking to each other in many different languages. And also, he would, the reason he wanted to do this piece is that he illegally had a recording of, from the British military of a plane going down. Mm -hmm. And then this whole conversation that was occurring between the air, air traffic controllers mm -hmm. when the plane went down, which is shocking. Mm -hmm. Like, in, in every way, it's viscerally undoing. Um, and so we, we used all of that text with the text of this poem. Um, for us to make a sound piece, mm -hmm. and, um, and and with the same intent, to um, give another reading and another hearing of the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So, any other questions, comments? How many of you are writers in here? Pretty many. <laughs> 
you do, how many of you use, um, do a lot of research for your writing? That's great. That's unusual. Wait, let's say what we mean by research. Um, just occurred to me we live in the land of Google and iPhones, which I'm also very hooked up to. Um, so what do you mean by research? Can anybody tell me? How strange. So many of you do it. But what is it? <laughs> what is it? Ooh. Are you saying something about it? Someone? Um, oh. I do research by uh, just paying a deep interest to my interests or paying a lot of attention to them. And when common things come through, I delve into like furthering those connections in any way I can. In any way you can. What's the content of in any way you can? Um, finding as many metaphors or analogies that uh, I think are the same or comparable. Don't you feel horribly claustrophobic when you do that? No. I do. I always feel like, okay, I can generate hundreds of metaphors and analogies, but what could someone else do? Do you go to other people's metaphors and analogies? Uh, yeah. Especially with storytelling, finding um, maybe like folk tales or something that uh -huh. relates to maybe a scientific concept. Uh, Great. That's great. That's exciting. Well, you saw, um, I showed a picture of, um, out of this beautiful hand-illustrated book of Grimm's fairy tales. Um, I think I showed it. Um, anyway, it's the last image in this Aerodrome Orion and Starry Messenger book. It's of this um, female person flinging open some windows and all these birds are flying out. And so, yeah, I do that too. I try to use legend and fairy tale as sources for somebody, somebody else's thinking about these things. So I'm getting the feeling that it's really lunchtime. Are people ready to stop? Or are there any last questions? Yes, please. Oh, good, yeah. Am I the only one? No, there are two people, so that's, that's great. Uh, I've been unsure about asking those questions. That's but fine. I'm afraid that I heard you wrong before. So it's gonna end up. Not I can clarify whether you did or not. Okay. Um, when you're talking about uh, Proteus and how Proteus is broken down into becoming uh, truth or like broken down speech of, of prophecy, and then later you're talking to Julia about um, the problem with legibility, I couldn't help but wonder even earlier in the lecture if Proteus was prophecy or truth the whole time, and you could see it in the currents or the spots or the branches of whatever he was turning into, or they were turning into, and if you thought about that before, and what your thoughts are on Yeah, that. I'm not sure I understand your question, but okay. if I do, um, <laughs> let me answer a bit, and tell me if I did or didn't understand okay. your question. Um, my sense of that is that the people who are wrestling with Proteus to get an answer want a stable truth. They want, well, it's, they want directions mm -hmm. for how to get home. This is in the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. And they want to know what's happened to their um, comrades. Um, but what I'm hoping to suggest is that um, Proteus is trying to avoid um, a stable truth. That's why you have to wrestle with him. Mm -hmm. So there may be like there may be many different shapes of truth. In this yeah. case. Is that what you? Were yeah, I was thinking about um, how that truth could be stable in the way that it's also legible in the way that you could understand it. But all the other shapes of Proteus could be truth and symbols broken down. Yeah. I, I agree, they could be. Yeah. And I'm not against Proteus. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Although, as a model for writing, mm -hmm. it's fantastic, but it has its limits. Like in a class that I teach, I brought in Proteus as, a, as an example because instead we were going to be looking at a vase as an example, and that just seemed too static. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, did you? Well, I, I don't know, this is just a thought about like, Please. Maybe what you were asking about what you just said about Proteus and 
talking about talking about like language and talking about um, text and truth and stable truth. It's like is when Proteus is changing. There's this whole thing that I'm we're coming across with like interpretive in our class, like the interpretive and building like these interpretive centers. And one thing that comes up is that to interpret some, to like, for someone to interpret something and re-demonstrate it, the audience needs to be prepared to interpret what is being interpreted for that translation to happen. And so it's like, with Proteus changing all these forms, is he like, is he still telling them the truth, the stable truth, in a way that they don't, aren't interpreting it? Yeah, is that what you were trying to ask? Huh, that's an interesting question. I don't know, I'm kind of stuck on the idea of the audience needing to be prepared. Mm -hmm. um, like, why bother? No, I mean, not, not really just that, but, but I mean, not why bother. Actually, maybe that a little bit, but more that scares me because who's doing the preparing of the audience? I, I don't think it's. I think it's more like, like, um, like it's all like it's all. I guess what I'm saying is that it's already there. Like it's like this whole thing with like them drawing the map or whatever, like drawing the map for campus. The campus is already there. Oh, and there so is a reference. There, so like if it's being presented in these other forms. Like if you don't understand the map that you're presented with, and you don't have the campus. Yeah. It does. Okay, I understand that. And 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 the next thought is, if you don't, then. <coughs> well, so I mean, that's that's what I meant by being prepared. Is like being. It's like when we're talking about this being English, obviously English. Like we all speak English, but it might not mean anything. <laughs> but, or it might not be the, it might not be the English we speak. Okay, well, we can maybe after this we can revisit that. Too. Did you have a question too? Yeah, you can take this in the direction and it be great. Um, okay. And too with the audience change it, I'm wondering who you consider your audience, and as part of that, whether or not you consider your writing activism. Oh, that's a great question. Um, oh yeah, do I consider my audience? And do I consider my writing to be activism? Or who do you consider to be your audience? Oh, who do I consider to be my audience? Okay. Um, so the first question, who do I consider to be my audience? I live in San Francisco. And um, I, that's relevant and not relevant to the question of who I consider my audience to be. It's relevant in the sense that um, I've lived there for a long time, and I live there very deliberately. I live there because there's a very active writing community. And um, when I finished graduate school, I was told that I had to move because I had to go somewhere else to get a job. But I decided not to because of writing, and I found a job, but in any case, um, so it, there are some people in San Francisco who are also poets, um, who I consider kind of like um, writing um, family, maybe you might say. I'm sure there's a better word for that, but in any case, something like that. And then um, really all over the world, there are people who, I'm, I'm in communication with them, um, mostly by email. Um, I, I, I have for eight years co-run a translation and conversation symposium with a Greek poet in Greece. And um, so there are a lot of um, concerns that I, I have about what is possible to do in one kind of culture at varying political moments. And, um, I am in conversation with, of course, the poets in San Francisco and elsewhere, but especially many poets in Greece about that and write, you know, they, they have a very, um, they've always had a, a, a very different situation than the one in which I write, but right now it's become an acutely different one. Um, I don't think in terms of, like, is my writing political or is it not political? or am I an activist, or am I not? 
I think that if one is engaged with political issues in one's life, then your writing can't avoid, I mean, it can't avoid engaging in those political issues in all kinds of ways, formal, content-wise, um, all sorts of ways. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah. Another question. This is a pretty short question, but do you think writing can happen without research? Like, because writing is kind of like the, I just like, like, what comes out out of like out of research in a way like even internal research or like the analysis that you have and like what you're living through and also do you think writing itself is an act of re like is research yeah that, that's great those are great questions um well there are a lot of people in the world who think like um socrates implies in the ion that not only is writing possible without research but that it happens by inspiration um, and that inspiration is not a kind of, not necessarily a kind of research, it's a, a sort of like, what, what to call it? I don't know, I'm not, I, I shouldn't say because I'm not, I would have to look at in that context what is meant by inspiration. But, um, I, I, and I, I think, you know, you, you look in many places and you'll see writing that looks like it has not happened by research. It's happened on a model of trying to make something pretty, usually. Um, for me, writing, doing research, and whatever, I mean, there's a lot of things to, to consider doing research, um, but being in a constant state of curiosity and trying to understand um, beyond my own ways of thinking what's happening, that's that decipheritude kind of state. Yes, it's always research, and, um, and it's always inadequate to whatever is being researched. Inadequate, it doesn't, it doesn't do it justice. It doesn't um, address it in a full enough way. So more has to happen, or less. Or, is that kind of what you're talking about, or kind not? Of. Huh? Kind of. Only kind of? Um, Let me. I guess, like, assuming that, for example, like, anything you do can be constituted as research, which is like kind of what I think at least. It's just like the writer mentality that transforms it in, like into an act of research because you're thinking about those things that are happening to you in a way that they become research. I don't think anything one does can count as research. I don't go for that. I mean like not anything, but like, I guess like the symptom of the writer of transforming things into like analytical thought that could be constituted as research. It could be if it isn't a it, it could be, but it, I don't think everything is necessary. I don't think that what you just described is necessarily. I guess my, and my ultimate question is like the act of like writing something on a piece of paper research. Like is the act of writing. It's research. interpretation, it's translation, that's for sure. Yeah. And it may, in my view, it may or may not be research. Depends on, we it have to like understand how it happened, mm -hmm. what the person was up to. Yeah. So, possibly. Specifically like poetry. I'm sorry? Specifically in poetry. Possibly. <laughs> okay. So shall we stop? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you.